Hi, I'm Scott Donaldson with Flock, the agent-based modeling library in JavaScript. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to create the game of life using Flock. So the game of life is a cellular automata, which is a type of simulation that usually takes place on a two-dimensional grid. And on a grid, each of the cells has a certain state value. And in the game of life, the state is either dead or alive. There's only two states. In other cellular automata, there could be a variety of states that a cell can choose from, but this is a very simple model with just two states. And yet despite that, we can see that there's a lot of movement happening here. Um, it's a very dynamic model. Uh, it follows simple rules at the level of the individual cell, but if I refresh here, you'll see that the result is very different from what we were just looking at. As, and at, as time goes on, uh, the model evolves and becomes totally different from what it was before, and it, it even, it's, even though it's uh, deterministic from the initial configuration, what happens in this model, it seems to be pretty random, pretty chaotic. So I'll show you a simpler structure within the game of life, and this is called a glider gun, uh, which creates gliders, those little entities that sort of go off into the uh, right and bottom of this window. And this is a structure that could arise randomly, um, but it's pretty unlikely to. Uh, it's very determined by the initial configuration and having a certain number of cells in the right positions be alive. So this is also a reverse of the opposite one. In this version of life, the black cells are alive and the white ones are dead. Whereas in this model that we're going to be building, uh, just because I think it looks a little cooler, we're going to have the background be black and the white cells be alive. So. We'll talk about how to create this, but first I want to talk about those rules that the cells follow. So according to this page, there are four rules, and we're going to code all of them in just a minute. But the rules are that with every tick of the simulation, each cell looks to its eight neighbors in the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, as well as northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. And any cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation. And then any cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies as if by overpopulation. And finally, any dead cell which has exactly three live neighbors, no more, no less, becomes a live cell, as if by reproduction. So we're going to start a new model now, and the easiest way to do that is to go to flock.network slash new. So I've got the home page of flock right here. I'm just going to type in slash new and visit this page. And this redirects me to a code sandbox. Code sandbox is a development environment in the browser that lets us be able to see what we um, want to visualize in our model in real time. So this template that I'm working with has uh, all of the classes imported from flock that exist. Uh, in, in the Flock library, but we're not going to need all of these. We just need a few of them for the game of life. And the only ones that we need are environment, canvas renderer, and terrain. And I'll talk about what each of these do in a little bit. We can also see that this template uh, sets up an environment, which is something that basically every Flock model needs. There's a setup function where we can set up other helpers and uh, starter configuration, and then there's a run function. And both of these functions are called at the end, the setup function followed by the run function. But the run function also calls itself, you might notice this request animation frame, that's a built-in browser function. So it's not specific to flock, but what request animation frame does is it says, okay, as soon as you're able to, as soon as you, the screen has finished drawing, I want you to run this function again. And since run contains that, it's going to keep on requesting itself over and over and over again. And that's how we run the simulation, is this run function just keeps on doing what it says. It keeps running. The other thing that run does is call environment.tick. And this is what tells the environment, okay, any agents that are in there, any renders that you have, any helpers, all of them should do whatever they're supposed to do when you tick. And it just happens automatically when we call environment.tick. Okay, so that's the bare bones that's going on in this script. 
What we need now is a renderer so that we can visualize what's happening in our model. So I do that by using the const keyword and saying const renderer equals new canvas renderer. And that takes as its parameter the environment that we want to use with it. Something that we also need is we need to say how, what the dimensions of our model are going to be. So it needs a width and height that we can pass to the environment in the renderer. I'm going to do that above these so that I have uh, access to them on the lines below. But I'm going to say const width equals 100 and height also equals 100. It eventually we'll scale up to 500 by 500 like this model shows, but right now we'll start small. And it can be a good idea to start smaller and more conservatively because you want to make sure that it's working at a lower dimension that's more computationally uh, easy to carry out before you try and go big. So we need to tell both the environment and the renderer that we want to use this width and height. Right now we're instantiating a new environment without any configuration options, but we can pass an object to it that has width and height keys to tell it that we want the width and height to be used in the environment. And I'm using a shorthand here. This is the same as writing width colon width, if you're familiar with JavaScript object notation. This just tells it use the width key for whatever the value of the width variable is in this scope, and same for the height. We're going to do the same thing with the canvas renter, only this configuration object will be the second parameter after the environment. And now finally, we need to tell the renderer where on the screen we want to draw. So the way to do that is with the mount method, which takes a string that should be a selector matching the element you want to use. So we can write renderer.mount, and then if I switch over for a second from my index.js file to my index.html, which has the markup of the page that we're looking at, we can see that there's a div with an ID of container that's empty. And that's a perfect place to drop our renderer in. So Canvas Renderer, when it starts up and running, is going to add a canvas to this container, and it will do the rendering onto that canvas. Since it's an ID, we can use the hash symbol. So renderer.mount hash container, and this string will now refer to that container element. So the last helper that we want to set up in the global scope outside of our setup or run functions is the terrain. And the terrain is what actually provides that 2D grid that I talked about that cellular automata, like the game of life, use. Obviously, we instantiate it with the const keyword, and we can say const terrain equals new terrain. And we're going to give it a width and height also. But with a terrain, since the dimensions are so critical, Width and height are taken as the first and second parameters, respectively. And we also want to tell the environment that we're going to be using this terrain as a helper. And the way to do that is with the use method on the environment. We write environment.use, and then we pass that terrain that we just instantiated to it. So there's one other thing that I want to do that you might not uh, be familiar with, and that's to pass a configuration option to the terrain. And we're going to tell it that we want to use grayscale mode instead of color mode. This is just going to be a little bit easier to work with. The way that I do that is a third parameter, a JavaScript object that just has a single key, grayscale true. This is going to tell it to use grayscale mode instead of color mode. So in color mode, the values of individual cells are stored as pixel-like objects. So those are objects with R, G, B, and A keys. But in grayscale mode, all of the values are just single numbers, which makes it a little bit easier to work with. So we can see that there's nothing happening on our screen still. But in our setup function, we can call a terrain method that will start drawing things to the screen immediately. And what we want to do is set the initial values of the terrain coordinates. The way to do that is with the terrain.init method. And this is going to take a function that should return the value that we want to initialize all of our coordinates to. So we can see from this pop-up that shows up here, and this is one of the really nice things about code sandboxes, it'll uh, give you hinting and it'll tell you um, some of the documentation of the code that you're writing. This takes a, a function 
which is a terrain rule, which has the parameters x and y. So I'm going to start writing that in here, and I'm going to use JavaScript ES6 arrow syntax. So this is our callback function that we're passing to init. It has x and y parameters, and it's going to return a value. So I mentioned that in grayscale mode, values should be numbers, and those numbers should be between 0 and 255. 0, which means the least amount of light in there, will draw a black pixel to the screen. And if I do that right now, and save this and refresh the window, we should see in a second a black square right in the middle of the screen. Of course, if I change this, if I make it 255, it'll look invisible. But if I change this to, let's say, 235, which is almost as high as it can go, we get a very light square, or a very light gray square. 255 would be pure white. So this is a good start, although we actually only want 0 or 255. So one thing I'm also going to do back up in the global scope is create some aliases. And I'm going to say that const dead equals 0, or black, and const alive equals 255, or white. And now we can use these names instead of the numbers, which will make it a little easier for us to remember what we're doing and to reason about what we're doing. So instead of returning 0, I can now return dead, and this returns the value of dead, which is 0. Of course, we don't want to instantiate it to all dead cells, or nothing will happen in the game of life. If you remember that last rule, only any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell. So we need to start with some live cells, otherwise nothing will happen. One way we can do that is by using the math.random function. And this, again, is uh, not a flock function. It, it just comes with JavaScript. Whenever you're writing JavaScript, you have access to the math object and a number of functions with it. And math.random returns a number between 0 and 1, which can be useful if you think of 0 to 1 in terms of percentages. So if we want something to happen 50% of the time, we could call math.random and then compare it to 0 0.5. And that's what I'm going to do on this line. If math.random is less than 0 0.5, so this means there should be a 50% chance of this happening, then I want to return alive. And now we can see that our environment looks kind of noisy. It looks like if you turn on an old school TV and there's static on it. And we can adjust the percentage because we probably don't want it to be so crowded or a lot of these will die off immediately from the first rule. If we don't want it to be so crowded, we can adjust this 0.5 value. So if I make it 0.25, now there should only be a 25% chance of returning a live cell. We can see that it's a little sparser. I could go down all the way to 10%, and then it's going to look mostly black with some white in there. I found that 15% is actually a good starting value, so that's what will make it. So if there's a 15% chance, then make it in a live cell, otherwise make it dead. And that's our setup function, or our init function, which initializes all these values. Next, we need to add an update rule, which tells it what, what should happen with every tick of the simulation. Given one cell's state, what should its next state be? We do that by calling terrain.addRule, which has the same function signature as init. It's going to take a function with x and y parameters, and it should return a, va a new value. Uh, it also doesn't actually have to return a value. If it doesn't return anything, it will assume that the value should just stay the same, and that's what it'll do. So if I copy and paste this here, that means that it's going to be calling this initializing function with every tick of the simulation, and we should see some uh, very staticky noise just randomly appearing on the terrain. And there we go. So yeah, now it looks even more like a static TV. So we want to bring some order into this, and we can follow, we're going to start coding these four rules. But you'll notice that all of them reference the cell's neighbors. So that's an important piece of data that we're going to need to get. And fortunately, terrain provides a function that we can call to get the neighbors of a cell. And that is terrain.neighbors. I'm going to assign it to this local variable, neighbors.
So terrain.neighbors takes x, y, and we can look at these parameters because they, um, they're going to be important. It takes x and y values of the cell that we're looking at. It takes a radius, which tells us how far outside of it to look. We're just going to want 1 because we only want the immediate neighbors, although in some other models you might want to go 2, 3, or more. And then the last parameter is a boolean, which is called more, and this refers to what type of neighborhood we want to get. So in cellular automata, there are two kinds of neighborhoods that we might want to use. There's something called the von Neumann neighborhood, which is what this function defaults to, and then there's a more neighborhood. A von Neumann neighborhood only gets the cells in the cardinal directions north, south, east, and west around the cell. However, we want the more neighborhood, and this gets the cardinal directions plus the corners. So since that's what we want, we're going to fill in the parameters to this function now. So we give it x and y, we give it a 1 for a radius, and finally we say true, meaning give us the more neighborhood, all eight neighbors of the cell and not just four. And now we can see if we hover over neighbors that its value is going to be an array. That's what this square bracket syntax refers to of either numbers or pixels. And this refers to what mode the terrain is in. So like I said, since we're in grayscale mode, this is going to be an array of numbers, which has the values of the eight neighbors of this cell. And since it's a, a JavaScript array, we have access to a lot of array methods that allow us to manipulate the data in it. And the helpful one that we're going to use is array.filter. So again, because this array contains all of the neighbors of the cell, not just the living ones, it might look something like 0, 0, 255, 0, 0, 255, 255, 0. This is just one example of what it might look like. And all we care about is that this array has three living neighbors. So we want to somehow get from this data to the number 3. And a way we can get there as an intermediary step is to strip out all of the cells that are dead. So we want to convert this array of 8 into an array of 3 that only has the map values that are living. And the neighbors dot, or sorry, array.filter method is how we'll do that. So we'll assign it to a variable because it returns a new array. And we'll say living neighbors equals neighbors.filter. And this takes a callback function which should return a boolean value for what we want to match. So we want to compare the value, v, I'm using this arrow syntax again, and we want to say uh, join the new array if v is alive. And now living neighbors should look pretty much exactly like this, only it might vary in size. There might only be one living neighbor, or there might be three, or it's possible there are even eight, but it's going to be some array that only contains those living values. And now, we don't actually need access to those values, we just want to know the size of this array. And the way that we do that is with the length key, which I can actually just put on the end of this line. So neighbors.filter only give me the live ones, and then take the length of this array. And now, living numbers is going to be a number between 0 and 8. So now we have everything we need to be able to encode the rules in this model. And the first one, it says that any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies as if under by underpopulation. So on a new line, I'm going to write if living neighbors, which is a number, if that's less than two, then we want to return dead. We want dead to be the next value of this cell. And we can see that immediate, pretty much right away, this is a much more sparsely populated environment than it was uh, before we put this rule in here. I'll just show you, if I comment this out, again, this is 15% living cells. If any cell with fewer than two neighbors dies off, this is what we get. And it happens pretty quickly, and that's because of this request animation frame function. It can be helpful sometimes to slow things down a little bit so that you can see what's happening more carefully. So if I comment out request animation frame, one way to do that is with another built-in browser function called set timeout. And this, like request animation frame, takes the function that you want to call, but you tell it how long you, it should wait. So if I do set timeout 1000, 
1000 is the number of milliseconds that you want to wait before calling it again. So it's now calling this function only every second, instead of as often as it can. And we can see them dying off much more slowly. Perfect. So we can encode the second rule now. The second rule says that any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. And when I said that uh, the rule doesn't have to return a value, that means that we actually don't have to do anything for this one, because this is a live cell that's not changing. So it's kind of a freebie. So number three, any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies. This one we do have to write in there, but it's pretty similar to the one on line 30 here. This is just if living neighbors is greater than three, then return alive. And we might see a few more die off here. Oh, and I made a mistake, but I can see something interesting happening. These big ones are growing and growing, and that's because I accidentally wrote alive instead of dead. Uh, I do want those to die off and not continue living, so sorry, little cells. But right now, they're just going to keep dying off, and it's just going to keep getting less and less populated. And it's not until we add in the last rule, any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes live, that we'll see something interesting start to happen. And again, although that refers to a dead cell, it's really a dead or living cell with exactly three neighbors, because a living cell that has exactly three neighbors is just going to keep on living. So we can compare for all cells if living neighbors is exactly equal, I'll use the triple equal sign for this, then return a new value alive. And now it's happening pretty slowly because we use the set timeout instead of request animation frame, but we can see something interesting happening. We can see that new shapes are starting to uh, appear and almost bloom in this terrain, uh, and some are starting to move around. It'll be a lot easier when we switch this off and go back to request animation frame. Now we can see the game of life happening as quickly as it can draw it in the browser here. And I think we're ready to scale it up. So our environment, or our terrain, is only 100 by 100 pixels now, but we can go ahead and make it 500 by 500. Now we can see the game of life in all of its glory, finished and running, and it'll run pretty much indefinitely. It's possible that uh, all of these cells will eventually die out or, um, or reach a stable configuration. Uh, but the most likely thing is that some number of them will just keep on moving and will keep on switching off and becoming dead or alive uh, infinitely as long as we keep this window open. So at this point I encourage you to uh, play with some of the parameters and see what else can happen. Um, one thing you could do is change the width and height. You can make it uh, a rectangle. It doesn't have to be a square. Um, I've found that 500 by 500 is sort of an upper limit on performance in the browser, but you know your computer might be faster or slower than mine, so it's worth giving it a try. You can change the values of dead and alive, so you can swap these. If dead is 255 and alive is 0, then we can see uh, living black cells on a white background. But probably what's most interesting is to change the starting percentage that are alive and the rules. So the game of life has these specific values of 2, 3, and 3. If it's less than 2, it's dead. If it's greater than 3, it's also dead. If it's exactly 3, it's alive. But those can be anything between 0 and 8. And of course, you can also look to a different radius of neighbors to use. And all of these will result in really different, really interesting, complex, dynamic models. Uh, and variations on the game of life. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you keep exploring and look out for upcoming videos on how to use Flock for uh, more agent-based modeling. Thanks for watching.